All right, the big announcements was this headline, AI's quote unquote bigger is better, faith begins to dim. That's the headline from Axios. But basically what they're saying is that they're saying the plateauing of AI because there's just not enough labeled data out there. And all of this money that people have been pouring into, all the investors were just assuming that more money equals more GPUs equals progress. And now investors, I don't know how they're feeling. This is a yellow canary in terms of how they will react to this fact that they're hitting a wall. So what do you think about that, Sasha? I think it's complete BS. And I think it's a basically just trying to drum up hype um, for headlines. I think it's taking a completely myopic view. Yes, we've hit a local maxima in consuming all of the available internet uh, data, but there's a huge, even larger data set sitting in enterprises and on personal computers that is significantly more useful. So Ilya Suskiver, former OpenAI, had this amazing quote. It says, quote, now we're back in the age of wonder and discovery once again, it's kind of this like, kind of like a, a little new agey, like we're yeah, back yeah. into discovery. But he's basically saying like, okay, we've now uh, hit the limit in terms of our former approach. Now back to research, back to trying to figure it out. I mean, that's the sort of glass half full version, but the glass half empty version is, oh crud, we've just capitalized this company assuming they're gonna like hit reasoning and AGI level five in two years. And they're telling there's not enough data unless they break into like the Library of Congress. Yeah, but I think, He's actually romanticizing, I think, the fact that we're back into this parallelization of research where there's so many different pathways that we have now. And he's actually saying like now more than ever, we actually have to choose which of these. And it's a high stakes game where it's no longer, it's like, hey, we've picked it. Let's see who can like take all the surface area as quickly as possible. It's now like, a, oh, we actually have to go out and feel out which of these new methodologies scale out. And they have, a lot of really promising candidates. And we haven't even commercialized and fully deployed all of the existing things. And if you look in just like the last two months, we've had real-time voice APIs, computer use come out, test time training and test time compute. I mean, these three things alone are gonna transform whole ecosystems and industries. And I, I, I share a lot of Ilya's excitement here. And, and I think, uh, again, looking back to say that AI progress is losing steam, I think is a little bit deceptive. And I think your characterization around parallelization is interesting because not only are they paralyzing different types of use cases, like you described, test time, compute, uh, computer control, as well as voice, but there's parallelization in the sense that like Mira Marathi, the CTO of OpenAI, she left to start a new company. There are new AI companies that are coming out there and they are giving OpenAI a run for their money, meaning they they do not have the keys to the kingdom in terms of potentially state of the art. It's up for grabs, in other words. That's actually why you see a lot of the labs saying that they don't want to publish their research anymore, and they won't even release in the case of like OpenAI with O1, they don't want to release the reasoning trees. And they're trying to maintain as much of that competitive advantage because this is something that you can reverse engineer. And we actually go through, uh, I think one of the headlines actually speaks to this. So here we are two months later and a Chinese company has replicated O1, two months. Yep. That's crazy. <laughs> like, yeah, you're referencing DeepSeek, uh, which came out, yeah. the, the, the came out just recently. They call it the R1. They claim to be an open source version of a model that does reasoning, i.e. it could take like 10 seconds for it to give you a first response. Yeah, and you can see their scores here compared to their original version. I mean, their performance has increased substantially. I mean, and it, and it's on par, uh, or sometimes even beating the O1 preview model. And I mean, OpenAI does have the full O1 model, which is unreleased and those sorts of things. But it just shows you how quickly the the innovation here is happening. And and saying, you know, hey, well, there's six players now. OpenAI's lost its edge. Like even they're losing steam. It's like no, it's even more crazy that you've got these six other players in the ecosystem them now and they're all nibbling at each other's heels i actually see the competition here turning up even more going yeah forward. and it's funny because they actually jailbroke deep seek they got it to give out a meth recipe but at the same time because it comes from <laughs> china you can ask it some very basic questions on some slightly controversial topics and it like refuses to answer completely yeah. like silent on the topic so you're like it's super smart but kind of like very quiet about certain things, yeah. but it can be jailbroken. So it's like, wow, I see a ton of opportunity here for 
people to kind of dig in a little bit in terms of what's going on on the reasoning side of the yeah. one type stuff. And I think actually what you're going to see more than ever is the the terms of observability and alignment coming through. And these are concepts that we need to start getting comfortable with. How these models think, how they reason is actually going to be quite important. And the influence of governments, core values, morals all need to be expressed in these models. And you can actually see that's a, this is a perfect example of how up until now we've only had let's say models uh, developed with Western cultures, it's interesting actually seeing how this changes when you do get a completely different sphere of influence um, pumping out these models. So that's something I think to, to watch as the space heats up as well. Yeah, and if you're a founder, I'm like, okay, so maybe the the, the, the foundation model guys, they got a little work to do to just go back to the research and go back to the drawing board. But there's been some crazy announcements that we, this week that's gonna keep everyone busy, all you founders. Number one, ChatGPT desktop now can just sort of peer into your VS code, your X code, your terminal, whatever I base your coding terminals, it can just like look at it. You don't have to copy and paste anymore. It just sort of introspects and sees it, which I guess it just saves time, right? And it's crazy. I mean, it's interesting that they're developing the distribution mode here for their future product releases. And what initially started out as, hey, you can have a you know chat GPT app on your desktop turned into, hey, you can now um, avoid copying and pasting, which soon may turn into, hey, you, this is the terminal that allows you to control your mouse and your keyboard, and you can you know, set up agentic workflows and evolve from there. So I really see this as just being that incremental step towards um, unlocking those sorts of capabilities. Yeah, and like no uh, coincidence, Claude <laughs> had in their back pocket releases their desktop version and yeah. it's nothing special. It just puts Claude in a window on your computer and you can talk to it. It's again, it's a distribution play. They're just trying to kind of race to get their application onto your desktop and I'm gonna wait for that moment, kind of like the Alexa, Google Home, you know how they used to talk to each other? I'm yep. waiting for the moment when Claude Desktop talks to ChatGPT Desktop and just kind of go off. <laughs> they, the first thing they do is like go to the task menu, Close like <laughs> un uninstall the other one. <laughs> exactly. So Again, this week was no shortage of announcements. Gemini Live, which was previously on Android only, Hada, Google's in, in the race. They put the uh, Gemini Live on iOS and I have, an, I have an iPhone. So I finally played it with it. It was okay. But you know, I realized I'm not ready to talk to an AI like 24 seven. I, like, I don't want to talk to it. I don't know, how did you feel about it? I found the the responses, and this is universal, I, I wish there was a way to increase the response speed and the rate at which it speaks just to like one and a half or two X. I find one X or one, one time speed so painfully slow. It's like reading an audio book on one X. I don't know. I normally sit in that like two to two and a half <laughs> speed. Like I'd rather just read the text because I can read faster than listen to it at one X. So that's the main gripe that I've got with it. The only other thing I'd, I'd notice is that the Gemini answers seem more generalist than the Claude answers. It almost seems like the type of data they have trained on is very different. Like if you ask a specific medical question, I've noticed that Claude can go to like a crazy level of detail and it feels like you're speaking to a doctor. Whereas I have to really tease that out out of the, the Gemini ecosystem. So probably it's yeah. a lot harder to give, give an answer verbally than reading. And so they maybe purposely truncate or abbreviate That's the true. answers, right? Yeah, yeah, it's totally possible, yeah. But I mean, it's it's crazy that these these real time voice API and that these real time voice agents are free. I mean, there are very real costs associated with this, and again, it gives you a sense of just how hard everyone is working to to build that relationship, to build that trust, to build that distribution. There are really big plays going on here in, in big tech. I mean, Gemini Live on your desktop probably coming next week. And the other announcement that's kind of crazy is Mistral, uh, who we are investors, asterisk. They released Le Chat, a major upgrade. They get image uh, processing, OCR, vision capabilities in an open source model. And in the last two months, we're talking about two open source models that have released multimodal capabilities, which means they can look at images and like look at it. That's crazy stuff. What do you think? Yeah, and I mean, it's got really strong state-of-the-art performance across a number of benchmarks, um, Yeah, making it ideal for tasks like chart interpretation, document analysis, image understanding. These are all capabilities that, you know, you're going to see developing into agentic frameworks and founders going off and building it into tooling. So 
uh, super impressive and, and a huge unlock for the open source community again. And begs the question, these large capabilities coming out and, and being in the open source community, I mean, really like this is nibbling at the, the Frontier Labs uh, heels. It's again, like potentially a race to the bottom. Like it's not clear like where this ends. So there was this article I, I wanted to get your reaction on. Our friends at Menlo uh, Ventures, they uh, interviewed and surveyed about 200 or something companies, enterprise companies, to ask, you know, what are the models that are using? And according to their report, I mean, it is a limited data set. They said open AI's market share has actually declined from 50 to 34%. And the winner actually is uh, Cloud Sonnet 3.5. Although it's the same version, as we know, Cloud, Cloud Sonnet 3.5 got a major upgrade behind the scenes. It's really good for coding. Like there's a, there's a certain areas that people tend to favor it. And it just seems like, Wow, OpenAI, they're not, at, like, I always thought they were like superhuman, but no, they're not. They, they actually can lose a significant amount of market share because developers like us were smart. We know how to switch back and forth between the models. I wouldn't underestimate them because they have, in a number of occasions, hinted that they've got capabilities that they intentionally sandbag. And like, they, there could be more capability there. I mean, there's the O1 model that they intentionally haven't released. Again, safety and alignment concerns are the main reason. So I think the market share st statistics is one that you can point to and say, hey, that, this is objectively true. But in terms of where is the frontier and what is their capability, you, at the end of the day, have to like look at the research. And again, that previous episode that we spoke about, they've got like $6 billion to fund more research, scale this up. So... Um, I think the, the fight is just beginning. So it's still very, very early days in the roadmap to AGI. Do you change your predictions around AGI? No, I, I'm still, still like, if anything, it, some of these things are happening sooner than expected. So, um, yeah, I'd say 2026 end of year or, uh, 2027 sometime. And again, like that's two and a half years from now. So I think society is going to have to go through some pretty, Drastic changes and... Um... Yeah, I mean, this year has been like a ton of unknowns. I mean, our roadmaps have been totally, completely changed because of the innovations in the LLMs. But, you know, actually, I kind of welcome the recent news because it's kind of a breather. It just maybe says maybe in the next three months I can take a breath and like things will sort of settle in and just train our engineers how to better use LLMs, just sort of figure out how to apply it into our business models better. Uh, without yet another thing coming out that completely subverts everything you worked on this past month. Uh, so I kind of welcome that. And I think for founders, it's a good it's a good change of things, at least ending the year that way. Uh, a particular comment by Sam always takes me by surprise that he keeps saying it, but then I actually see it more and more myself. And it's speaking of founders, they keep building in the roadmap in the pathway to AGI. And these generalist uh, workflows consistently like end up being the place that they go off and try and incrementally improve rather than building the scaffolding around and, and assuming, hey, the capability here is going to get better. So that's an interesting thing here. I think the test time compute and test time training ecosystem and the, the new capabilities here, like haven't, and it's not entirely clear how to build on top of that yet. I actually just got the email today that the, the API is available. Um, so I've got to do some playing around there, but it's such early days, but everything is also moving so quickly that a lot of the founders can't find that stable ground and can't figure out where to build on top of. So it's kind of like this weird paradox of, look at all this fantastic tech that I can't even necessarily leverage because it's moving too quickly. So it's such a strange time to both be an investor and, and a founder, I think. I think the idea around what Sam said was that you know, don't get in the way of AGI and try, trying to like inject your own reasoning or your own yeah. uh, sort of uh, crutches to make it work. But think about the big problems that AGI can solve and build around that. And just, just assume, just trust me, it will come. It will come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you came. But there's a lot of people actually saying like, trust me, it'll come. And I see a lot of commentary, people saying, well, their, their vested interest is to make people believe this and, and those sorts of things. The researchers that, that I follow and, and that I speak to, they say like, no, like, this is legit. Like, we're, we're legitimately concerned. And this isn't us trying to, you know, cry wolf or anything like that. If you take the median perspective of the researchers, Dario's and the Sam Altman's of the world are representing a very accurate um, picture here. And, and there's even a, a tweet 
from Noam Brown, which reflects this. Like I, I take Noam, he's a very common sense uh, guy and, and doesn't overstate or understate, you know, just calls it like it is. And he's basically said the same thing. So I think that a lot of people need to start actually paying more attention to this space, but maybe I'm biased. So you're saying this is actually the scary time because although some of the headlines seem catchy because, oh, you know, AI is seen as end now, you know, it's starting to plateau. You're like, oh, uh, no. <laughs> no, no. Like it depends on which benchmark you look at. And if the benchmarks are becoming irrelevant this quickly, it means we need to find a whole new way to benchmark these capabilities. That's the real message here, which is even again crazier. So I wouldn't take any of the, the signals of us yeah. hitting the benchmarks as a sign that things are slowing down. Because yeah. it, it, it's kind of like a bell curve. If everyone's scoring, you know, 95 to, you know, 100%, and then someone goes from, you know, 95 to 96%, what else is there to, to optimize? The real question is like, what other areas, what other surface, what other modalities are we improving? And if we're suddenly releasing, hey, this thing can now speak to you at the same capability as a human being, and it can do it on the phone, it can do it on a video chat, it can do it on text, that's crazy. So Sasha, let, let me understand, because when you say we need new benchmarks, this is what I'm thinking. If you look at computer use, just knowing what we know, AI can control my computer, can do some crazy, crazy stuff. And the only reason it's not doing it is not for lack of reasoning or AGI, it's just safety alignment type stuff. It's just like, we gotta just be really careful. But assuming AI can control my computer, there's gonna be a new benchmark that doesn't exist today about how good yeah. you can control your computer. And like that might be the benchmark that will change everything like for more more people than, than than even a typical, can you solve an SAT math problem, which is what typical mesh bars look at. Exactly, and when you actually look at this, like we've created like, you know, some of the school grade tests, which are like very general. Tests are a terrible way of gauging someone's true capability. Like they're, they're very loose. Proxy. I agree, I agree. <laughs> like in schools and, and like that's that's why they don't translate into to real world success. If you want to look at real world success, then we need to come up with a whole new ecosystem of benchmarking. So when I say observability and alignment, really what we're talking about in a way is benchmarking 2.0 or 3.0, where what we're talking about is like, hey, I need to do this um, accounts receivable, accounts payable process, or I need to do this customer service job. What is the benchmark for my specific industry, for this specific customer? What does good look like? And a lot of these models do well by knowing, by dynamically changing what the goalposts are to the task. The benchmarks need to be capable of doing that too. Otherwise, we're constantly seeing everything as a nail and we're saying we have a hammer, let's just like whack everything. So we need to kind of change that perspective. And, and I think that's where a lot of the, the labs are, are doing the research. And I think we, like you're gonna see a lot more focus going back into the reinforcement learning compared to currently what, you know, historically for the last couple of years, there's been a huge focus on reinforcement learning through human feedback. So that's humans basically giving the models feedback. But once we get to the point where the models can evaluate their own performance, then what you end up having is this flywheel where they can gauge if they did a certain amount of effort and they can then say, was this a good outcome? That's what human beings do, right? And and once you get to that point, that's when I think you'll start to see some really, really exponential uh, gains here as well. And that's what test time training and test time compute in a way unlock. So I see this uh, space only getting more exciting. I don't see it slowing down. Well, I am pretty excited too. I'm finally excited. I know I'm usually the old fart in this conversation, but I'm happy, I'm happy. I'm happy for everybody. Yeah. So have a wonderful Thanksgiving, man. Take care, okay? Likewise.